this is the plenary session and my name is Roisin Corcoran. I'm honoured to serve as the co-chair of the Campbell Collaborations Education Coordinating Group and to co-chair this session uh, with Sarah Miller. Uh, the title of the plenary session is the Education Endowment Foundation's Teaching and Learning Toolkit. And just to briefly tell you a little bit about the format of the event, um, we're going to start, I'll introduce our first plenary speaker, Steve Higgins, and then Steve is going to present for about 20 minutes. That will be followed by a very brief Q&A session. And then I'm going to introduce our second speaker, who will hopefully be with us soon, um, Patrick Ockwin. Patrick will present then for about 20 minutes, and that will be followed by a very brief Q&A. And then Sarah Miller is going to lead a Q&A and relay questions from the chat to our speakers. And then we're going to close the session. Uh, if you do have questions, can you please put them in the chat during the session? Uh, and we'll try and get to as many questions as we can at the very end. Um, you can also, of course, reach out to the presenters directly. They're very eager to hear from people and answer any questions um, or thoughts or comments that you have following their talks. And of course, I encourage all attendees to tweet using the conference hashtag, which is hashtag WWGS2022. And just to mention, this webinar is being recorded. So the recordings will be available from the Campbell Collaborations website event page and our YouTube channel after the event. So you can rewatch it as many times as you wish. The conference is hosted by the Campbell Collaboration and the UK and Ireland Campbell Centre. And it's co-sponsored by the Pan America Health Organization, World Health Organization. And I just wish to thank all of our presenters and all of our uh, conference sponsors for their continued support. Okay, so I'm going to start with introducing our first presenter, which is Steve Higgins. Steve is Professor of Education at Durham University. He has particular interest in the use of evidence to inform education policy and practice and the use of systematic review and meta-analysis to support this. He is the lead author of the Education Endowment Foundation's Teaching and Learning Toolkit. And as a former primary school teacher, he is especially interested in how evidence can support teachers' decision-making in schools. And Steve, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm going to stop sharing my slides so you can share yours. Okay, has that worked? Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay, um, thanks very much, Rasheen. Um, what I'm gonna do is talk a little bit about um, the teaching and learning toolkit um, and the current project that we're involved in at the moment to develop the toolkit into a series of um, linked uh, living reviews. Um, and then I'll also try and explain the connection between um, Patrick's work uh, and mine in terms of the partnerships that we're, we've been developing um, worldwide with the Education Endowment Foundation. But I do need to start by saying that although I'm presenting, um, the work is very much a, a team effort. Um, the the, the, the um, Education Endowment Foundation has supported uh, the development of the toolkit um, over more than 10 years. We're working actively with the uh, Epicenter team, um, particularly uh, James, uh, Ian and Sergio uh, in um, using some of the new tools they're developing, which I'll talk a little bit about. I've got a core team of staff at, at Durham um, who have been working with me for the last four years as well as a dedicated team of part-time coders with whom we would not have managed this project. Uh, and I should also thank the uh, Campbell um, collaboration for the opportunity to talk a bit about the project. 
Okay, a little bit of background. Um, the, the toolkit came about through a slightly odd set of circumstances. Uh, it, it actually came about as a, as a kind of policy review when uh, the UK government um, announced a strategy for England to provide additional resource for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the Sutton Trust uh, asked some of us at Durham to uh, think about how that money might best be spent by schools to support outcomes for disadvantaged uh, children in school. Um, just after that time, um, after they um, launched that report, the Sutton Trust uh, won a contract with uh, Impetus uh, to set up the Education Endowment Foundation, which was a very unusual project. The uh, administration at the time um, effectively invested 125 million pounds as an endowment, which was to be spent over the next 15 years. Uh, a very unusual circumstance in education, but that created the Education Endowment Foundation to develop a rigorous evidence base for uh, education uh, in England, particularly, uh, and to support outcomes for disadvantaged students. Once they were founded, um, they decided that they wanted to develop the initial work that the team at Durham had done uh, to create a resource to communicate research findings to schools. Uh, and that was the original development of the toolkit. Um, and over the next um, few years, that was developed into uh, a preliminary web resource or initial web resource with a number of areas um, of uh, focus um, educationally that schools might find interesting, such as feedback or mastery learning, collaborative learning, um, that schools might consider developing with the resource for the pupil premium. Um, it's currently, uh, in its current version, uh, a series of linked meta-analyses uh, with about 30 different um, areas of, of focus. Uh, and I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the, the major shift that we've made in the last four or five years uh, to create a series of, as I say, of, of linked living reviews. The original version of the toolkit was um, what I think of as a, a tertiary review a meta meta analysis so uh, rather than using single studies it collated findings from uh, meta analyses in different areas collaborative learning for example and, and pooled the findings for those uh, into an overall impact estimate uh, a fairly simple and crude approach uh, to give a, a a broad picture kind of broad brush uh, indication of the likely impact of uh, different um, areas of education research with an estimate of their cost uh, and an estimate of the security, the little padlocks, uh, as to how secure the evidence was in um, those different areas. This clearly had a number of significant limitations. Being a meta-meta analysis, you were limited very much by the original parameters of the underpinning reviews. Um, it was quite difficult to look at consistent moderator effects, for example, because they were usually unique to each different meta-analysis. So it was hard to understand what was under the, under the hood, if you like, of the different areas of research. Um, so uh, the Education Endowment Foundation agreed to uh, find a way to increase the granularity of those different areas by... Um, I think of it as unzipping, unpicking all of those different meta-analyses uh, and recombining studies with a set of consistent inclusion criteria uh, into single meta-analyses in each different area. Um, this then gave the opportunity to think about subgroups, so primary, secondary, different areas of outcomes, reading or mathematics. We could start to look at things like uh, variation by country or by region, and we can start to explore uh, different method methodological influences on the impact, so things like sample size, um, type of measure. It also offered the opportunity for partners to develop new strands um, and, and add studies uh, to a database through some um, global fellowships that the Education Endowment Foundation set up. The key feature for this, from my point of view, was it created an updatable set of reviews. It was uh, the granularity at the meta-meta analysis level is when a new meta-analysis is published, you add it. 
but with the current database, as new studies are published, they in theory can be added directly to the toolkit. So in the original version of the, uh, the toolkit, um, it was a simple kind of crude fixed uh, effect estimate of the estimates from a series of different um, meta-analyses. Um, averages of averages, yeah, okay, I understand all the limitations and people's unease with uh, that as an approach, but it gave a broad brush indication of different areas. What we've now got is um, a single uh, meta-analysis, in this case for feedback, which means that we've got uh, all of the uh, single studies and we can start to pick apart what drives variation in the overall effect uh, by exploring uh, different moderators uh, with a meta regression. It also means we can do um, subgroup analyses, looking, say, at primary or secondary or reading of mathematics and explore differences there. Um, the, this project has been undertaken in two different phases. Um, the first phase, which was completed um, uh, about a year ago, uh, we took apart the underpinning meta-analyses. So that was about 320 um, different meta-analyses. We tracked down the original studies, or at least as many of the original studies in those as we could, and then applied consistent inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, to those, and then uh, applied a series of um, data extraction tools, code sets to those, um, so we could have as much consistent uh, data across those different strands as we could and we also work to support um, partners in developing new strands and Patrick's going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, that of course uh, at phase one that's now complete the current version of the toolkit on the website um, reflects that that version that has its own limitations in that the coverage of the underpinning meta-analyses wasn't necessarily even so they were at different time points and there are different numbers of meta-analyses in the different strands, but it gave us a good way to uh, think about and start uh, a database of studies by using or building on what other researchers had already, um, already found. Uh, the next stage, which we're working on now, um, is to try and sort of even that up. I think of it as backfilling. Uh, it's looking at each of the different areas, using the studies that we've already uh, included and excluded to see if we can match those uh, into a large uh, open source bibliographic database, building on the work of the, uh, the epicenter, uh, and then again, screen all of those different areas, uh, add new eligible studies to the database and update those analyses. Um, the, th the, the aim of that is that once we've done that completely across all 30 different areas, we should just then be able to run further update searches um, to find new studies as they become available um, and add those uh, into what is a, in effect a series of um, linked uh, living reviews. Um, we're using um, Epi Reviewer, um, which some of you I'm sure will be familiar with, um, which is web-based systematic review software. We uh, initially reviewed um, a number of systematic review um, tools that were available, but one of the key features of Epi Reviewer that we wanted to build on um, was the way they were developing search and screening tools um, to use uh, machine learning. Um, to identify studies and both identify and screen studies and also they were one of the few systematic review software um, that also offers meta-analysis so it enabled us to run the whole process um, for the review within epi reviewer um, most other systematic review programs we'd have to so move between different software um, platforms um, so that was why we, we chose that and it's also given us the opportunity to partner with them uh, to develop some of the um, machine learning tools, which I'll talk about next. Um, the way I think about uh, the, the, this particular part of the process is we're using the studies that we unzipped, the studies that we found from the original meta-analyses, uh, and we're um, looking at the included and excluded studies from uh, those meta-analyses, 
and we're mapping them into this large open source uh, database called OpenAlex. Um, uh, the uh, the, the ma mapping algorithm um, looks at things like the title, abstract, uh, and the citation networks um, to identify potentially relevant studies. I think of it as a bit, a bit like Amazon. You know, you like this study, so you might like these. Uh, and then we apply inclusion criteria um, using what's called a priority screening process. This learns as you identify studies that are included and as you exclude studies, and prioritizes other studies that it's found in an overall order. And it updates that as you identify and include further studies. And then, um, as you can see from the, um, the image on the uh, uh, right hand half of, uh, of the slide, um, eventually that reaches a process where the, the graph flattens off and you don't find any new studies and you can be reasonably confident that there aren't any more left uh, in the data that you've got. The approach uses um, some um, classifiers. So uh, we're um, working with Epicenter to develop one for educational evaluations generally, um, but then also one that's specific to each toolkit strand uh, in the hope that that will give us a, a reliable and accurate um, means to find new studies uh, in the updating process. And then we go through a similar process to what we went through before the included studies are, are data extracted, um, but um, we should have uh, a, a review that can be much more easily updated in the future. Um, one of the reasons we're using priority screening is it just makes the process much more manageable. So this is an example of a actually a reasonably small um, strand summer schools where the initial screening pool that we found was over 5,000 um, hits. Um, we screened on uh, title and abstract, and uh, uh, we needed to screen uh, just over 1,200 in order to be confident that we'd found the relevant studies in that data set. And then we went through those included studies uh, on, on um, full text uh, and uh, included 37 that had been missed by the meta-analyses that we'd unzipped previously or well, I suppose missed or published since the meta-analyses were published. Um, we collect a fairly comprehensive set of information about um, each of the studies. So we've got three different data extraction tools. Uh, one that's I think of as a common coding set where we're trying to collect as much similar information about each study as possible. So that's by far the largest data set. We call it the main data extraction. Um, and it looks at things like the type of publication, design methods, uh, details about the study, where it took place, what was involved in the inter intervention, and descriptive information about the, the types of outcomes. We've then got a, a, an effect size um, data extraction tool, which focuses very much on the quantitative information. Uh, and then for each different area of the toolkit, we've got an additional data extraction tool, which pulls out strand specific information so if you're looking at something like feedback, uh, we might code as to whether it's written or verbal. If we're looking at something like peer tutoring, we might look at whether or not the, um, the groups of the pairings are equal or um, one um, tutor, is more the, the tutor is more capable than the 2T. So the whole series of things that we used, um, and then we can use those in the analysis, uh, which I'll move to talk about. Um, the analysis um, phase, um, because of the complexity of our data set, what we're doing is exporting the raw data from Epi Reviewer, which is in a um, JSON format. For those of you who are interested in the geeky detail, uh, we've got a fairly extensive data checking and cleaning process um, that goes through a, a couple of iterations with the aim that we can create a series of data frames for Metaphor, um, uh, an R package for meta-analysis. We also have a series of other data frames that we create that look at um, overall um, study quality risk of bias, which we call the padlock um, data frame. Uh, and then uh, we've got a series of structured output files um, that uh, are in our markdown, although my team are experimenting with Quarto at the minute. And then the working with the EF, we have a series of toolkit templates um, that uh, structure the write-up um, that has a, a very kind of defined structure. 
so that the global evidence base is used to inform the majority of that um, uh, that page. But because the toolkit is written specifically for uh, England, uh, it also has local paragraphs which can contextualize that information for a particular um, educational jurisdiction. Uh, and Patrick will talk a little bit more about that, I'm sure, in, in his session um, where he works uh, uh, with us and, and uses the core content to help develop a, a, a local version of the toolkit, but then writes um, local paragraphs where they've searched for relevant information or that can be contextualized uh, for particular um, needs within a jurisdiction. Um, there's also a technical appendix uh, with um, a series of forest plots, um, uh, which is configurable. So you can look at all of the studies. You could look just at the studies relevant to primary education. You could look at outcomes in terms of um, literacy or, or mathematics. So there is some uh, exploration that's possible at, at, at that level. Um, the final thing I'd really like to say about the database structure is the other reason for developing the database um, was that, yes, it, it solved a problem in terms of thinking about how to update the teaching and learning toolkit and increase its granularity by using single studies. But there's also a, another version of the toolkit which is aimed at um, early years. Uh, and there's a, a fairly complicated relationship between the two. Uh, they're not completely distinct, so there's a set of studies, don't worry about the detail, there's a set of studies and, and strands within the teaching and learning toolkit. And then there are some unique additional areas that are uh, only available in the early years toolkit, so an earlier starting age um, for um, preschool or nursery, for example, um, is unique to the early years toolkit. But then there are also some themes that run across the, the two. So the, the early years toolkit is basically a, a subset of those in parental engagement, for example, that are relevant to a particular age range. Um, all of these studies are in uh, the overall evidence database. So there isn't a single teaching and learning toolkit database. There's one big database that contains these. And then working with partners, um, which Patrick's going to talk about shortly, um, eBase have developed a teaching and learning toolkit for um, their um, region in Africa. Uh, that um, overlaps with both the teaching and learning tool toolkit and the early years toolkit. Uh, but then there are some strands, some themes that aren't relevant to those jurisdictions. So school uniform, for example. So they're not included within the eBase teaching and learning toolkit. Then working with um, eBase, uh, 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 they developed um, uh, some additional strands that they were particularly interested in uh, in informing uh, policy and practice in their region, which is menstrual hygiene management and cash transfers, uh, and they're only available within the uh, eBase teaching and learning toolkit. I just thought it was helpful to give an idea of the complexity of the database structure because it gives you some idea of the flexibility that there is now in terms of adding additional strands or themes um, or uh, in terms of uh, thinking about how additional outcomes could be added. So um, in some er areas of the, of the world, something like school completion or attendance might also be important as well as attainment. I'm just going to finish up briefly by mentioning the International Toolkit Partners and, and Patrick will pick this up uh, in his talk. Uh, we work with a number of um, partner organizations around the world who've contextualized the toolkit for their particular jurisdictions. Um, uh, and um, they use this global local structure. So the core content is the same, but then there's local contextualized inf uh, information for each of those different areas. OK, I think that's me. And um, Regine, for questions. Yes. Do you want me just to pick those up? Um, the questions I can see. So it does. Um, it does seem like uh, Rosin is saying something. 
so yeah, Connie sorry about that. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. I was talking to myself. Um, so Steve, first of all, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Very thought provoking. There's lots of questions in the chat and Sarah's going to pick up on those in a moment. Um, I'm going to ask one question and while we're doing that, Steve, if I could ask you to stop sharing your slides and Patrick, if you want to start sharing yours and I'll pull those onto the main stage in a moment. Um, so just in the changeover, Steve, one question um, for you. So how successful has the use of Open Alex and priority screening been? And could these be used more widely by other researchers? Yes, um, and, and my my hunch would be that this will be a direction that um, systematic review will go in to use these big open access bibliographic data sets just because of their comprehensiveness. It's not without its challenges, though. Um, education is a, what I think of as a loosely classified and framed subject, so terminology and definitions are quite fuzzy. That means uh, it can be you can get 10,000 hits still and it can take a long time to wade through the screening process until the curve flattens and you're confident you found all of the ones that are relevant. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, a very powerful tool. It's a, a bit of a steep learning curve to get started and we were very lucky to have the support of the epicenter uh, in, in doing that. But I do think that's the direction that systematic review will go in rather than having to set up search strings and apply them to all of the different separate databases. Uh, you'll be able to set up a search that's run on um, this kind of big open source data set. That's wonderful. I'm just thinking for the education coordinating group of wonderful sessions, training sessions that you could lead for us, Steve on the software. <laughs> <laughs> with help from my team <laughs> <laughs> okay well look thank you so much we're going to move to the second um presenter so let me just bring uh, patrick up. okay so patrick uh our next presenter is patrick Ockwin. he's team lead at east africa and district medical officer at the bali district health services at the Ministry of Health in Cameroon, board member at Guidelines International Network. He's also active in getting research evidence into policy, practice and households in Middle Africa. Patrick's work includes conducting systematic reviews with the Cochrane Collaboration, conducting evidence implementation projects with the Joanna Briggs Collaboration, conducting impact evaluations with development agencies, including the World Bank and the WHO. Patrick has used digital health extensively at district level in Cameroon to improve maternal and child health using phone-based and web-based applications. Patrick, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Steve, for leading the stage. Uh, I'll be talking about the e-based teaching and learning toolkit. And in essence, this toolkit was transfer of meta-analysis from uh, existing toolkit, uh, but taking into consideration the context and bringing on board the very strategic approach of uh, efficiency, reducing costs and reducing, wa reducing waste in research. So uh, most of the work that I'm the work that I'm presenting today is actually funded by the Education Endowment Foundation and the CEDIL program, and we worked closely with Durham University to support especially uh, capacity development in evidence synthesis. Okay. So. Uh, our discussions today will look a little bit at the background, the challenges with contextualization, the data, the key components to consider when uh, contextualizing stakeholder and policy uh, events, which has been uh, a, a very interesting innovation that facilitated the uptake of evidence in decision making in our context. And then we'll also look at how to predict transferability of uh, of, of mid-level theories from one context to the other. And then we'll also look at the eBay's uh, uh, teaching and learning toolkit, which you can actually explore for yourself on the website. 
www.ebaselearning.org. Uh, then we'll also look at transfers, uh, transfers of evidence into policy, into practice, and into households. This is an approach that we believe is very important, especially in our context. Looking at transferring the, the, the evidence just into practice is not enough. We need to start from policy, but we also need to keep in mind that the households are the areas where this evidence will actually be in action. Now, the context uh, 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 we were looking at or we're working in is the Lake Chad Basin. Now, the Lake Chad Basin is made up of primarily Cameroon, Chad, Nigeria, and Niger, uh, or what we refer to as Middle Africa. But most of the activities around that lake in itself affect beyond these four countries. A problem in this area affects the rest of the country. So I could also say that low literacy levels in these areas could affect the way people even manage the water that is in this lake and could affect the much of sub-Saharan Africa because this lake actually influences what's going on ecologically in most of, uh, of, of, of Middle Africa. Uh, in the, within the Lake Chad Basin, I want to highlight the fact that uh, based on evaluation of uh, literacy and numeracy, these four countries are actually amongst the lower 10 percentile of countries performing uh, based on standardized tests that has been taken across African countries. There is also low research leadership from this context. A lot of research is done from this context, but most of the time it's led by maybe PhD students who come with their interest and their objectives. And this may actually miss out on contextual outcomes that are a priority. There's also low research uptake, primarily because the research sometimes do, do not answer their questions and also sometimes because the capacity to uptake this research is also weak. Uh, this uh, Middle Africa is mostly uh, French speaking as well. And as we know, most publications, uh, authors will prefer to publish in English. And this is something which at eBase we have been looking at as something which is actually unfair. Because if you consider conducting a research in Cameroon, where your participants are French speaking, and then because you want to get a high readership, you decide to publish this in English. Then you find out that your participants may not even be able to have access to that data. So there are also other languages apart from French, like Hausa, that's spoken in this area, like Kiswahili. So these are all things that we need to, as researchers, be responsible to, cons to ensure that people who do not speak the language that we want to publish with and who are participants of our research are still able to access those. That was on our side. Now, I would want us to just look at a little bit at original research outputs globally. So if we look here, we find out that the, the European and the North American regions are doing quite well. They actually generate all the scholarly outputs or most of the bulk of the scholarly outputs that we see. And we see that the lowest here is the African outputs, meaning that this is why it's important that we look more, a little bit more at the leadership for scholarly outputs from the African region. If we want, uh, the, 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 if we want research evidence to be relevant, especially for this context. And if we look again at the four countries in which we are focusing on, we find out that Nigeria is leading. In fact, Nigeria stands outside its peers when it comes to scholarly outputs, followed by Cameroon and then Niger and Chad is almost having nothing because of the challenges that are within this context. It tells us that Cameroon, Niger and Chad are priority areas that we need to be thinking about as leaders in research if we are interested in equity. And I believe this is a strong point and the strategy of the Campbell collaboration. And this data is coming from Elsevier. Now, again, let me zoom in a little bit on the context and I will look at the case of Niger. I mean, the case of Cameroon and uh, uh, Chad and Nigeria are very similar. 
but I picked on Niger because uh, this is this is about the average within this context. So it gives an average picture. Now, if we look at the infographic that we have here, we've looked at literacy and numeracy. It's, it's generally looking at attainment. We looked at literacy and numeracy, looked at equity outcomes, and looked at evidence in policy. And this is within the work, the We Attain work that we did with uh, EEF and the CEDIL program, where we explored what it takes for kids to go to school, what is the existing literature, what uh, are the statistics on literacy and numeracy, and what are the statistics of evidence in policy. We find out that in Niger, less than one kid out of five can read or write, uh, and less than one kid uh, yes, can read or write, and less than one kid can count. And then if we look at issues around equity, we find out that menstrual hygiene played a key role. Girls are not well represented in schools. Apart from the fact that girls, are, uh, girls attendance is lower than boys attendance, we find out that even the structuring of the schools, the built environment of the schools, does not give opportunities for girls to want to stay in schools. And we find out that with this, access and retention for girls become even more important than quality of education because the girls are not even there in schools. So you cannot even start talking about quality uh, uh, education for girls because getting them to school is first of all a challenge. Evidence in policy is also not reported at all in Niger, for example. And this is the game that we seek at eBase to change. And to look at first things first, we are very interested from outside quality of teaching and learning, access and retention, governance, and safety and security, because these are things that are very relevant for this context. There's a lot of conflict going on. There's also prevalent corruption within governments that this can all affect how kids are learning in schools. Then, there are existing guidance for conceptualization. So before we went into looking at how do we contextualize from the existing toolkits, we asked ourselves, what have other people done to contextualize? And these are just a few. And one of them is, was used within the South African context. And it's very important because it's closer to what we do in Africa. And this was done within the program called the SAGE program, or the South African Guidelines Excellence where they looked at how to adopt, how to contextualize, or when to adopt, when to contextualize, and when to adapt. And they looked at uh, evidence as a box that you want to carry. You can just carry it as it is. You could contextualize it, or you could adapt it to your own liking. And there is also the grade development, which is development, which, which is developed at McMaster, which also has a framework that tells you when to adopt, when to adapt, and when to contextualize. But when we looked at the existing contextualizing guidance, we felt that uh, it was important that we look at an approach that will be more objective and that could be incorporated into machine learning and then can automatically take a systematic review, a meta-analysis, and then predict to us if we should adopt, if we should contextualize, or if we should adapt. So in moving forward, we had a process of stakeholder engagement, we reviewed the existing, summer, the existing uh, uh, evidence within the toolkit, which is the, in this case was the uh, EEF toolkit. We reviewed the existing evidence within our context, then we predicted, we started predicting transferability. And then we will decide at this point, based on the probability of transferability, whether to adopt, to contextualize or uh, to evaluate. I mean, evaluation means that we will have to develop from scratch. Evaluation will mostly be meaning that there is no evidence in our context and we need to test what interventions are effective or what interventions actually work. And I would like to highlight that the, the transferability tool that I'm talking about here is still in development and we are really interested in having more partners and more funding and more capacity in moving forward with this. Now, the first step within the process is the stakeholder engagement. And the stakeholder engagement is a situation where we get the stakeholders together at the beginning of the study. And this happened, for example, in the, in the strand that uh, Steve mentioned earlier, which is the menstrual hygiene management uh, strand. The menstrual hygiene management strand seeks to 
develop a strand that can facilitate access and retention for girls so that they can now have access to good quality education from the perspective of uh, menstrual hygiene management. And when we found out that girls are missing up to 40 days from school because of their menses, and this could be because they cannot afford pads when they are bleeding, so they would prefer to stay in school, or because some cultural aspects prevent them from coming to school while they are menstruating, we find out that in a year, they will be missing at least 40 days uh, from, from, from school. So we started with these stakeholder engagements, having conversations with community members, traditional leaders around menstrual hygiene management and policy makers to really understand what could be the things that were affecting moving forward. And then the other thing that we do is we look at the existing data. So here we have a set of data that we pulled out from the Education Endowment Foundation Toolkit. And we broke this data from each strand into interventions. And these interventions, we tried to work with stakeholders to understand whether the outcomes within the studies in this intervention or the studies within this meta-analysis was relevant to the context, if it was uh, uh, too complex for the context, if the cost was low, high, or medium for the context, if, the, if within the context and for the different stakeholders and the different uh, vulnerable groups, this was an important uh, 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 intervention. And if and what was the average scores of these outcomes? And then the overall effects from the research. And we used all of this data to impute in mathematical formulas to predict the, uh, the transferability of this toolkit to our setting. Now, um, I give here an example of one of the meta-analyses that we used, which was from a Campbell uh, review, which was for targeted school-based interventions for improving reading and mathematics for, for students with or at the risk of academic difficulties in grades 7 to 12, a systematic review. So the first thing when I look at this title is the grading, the grades is grades 7 to 12. So in our context, we already have to start asking ourselves, what is grade 7 to 12? Because this means this may not mean anything or may, may mean something different in our context. So this is where we start from. However, as I've always mentioned, there is more similarities than differences, although these differences are very important. It is important that we look out for those similarities and then we try to see how we can manage the differences. And within our toolkit or our transferability tool, uh, in order to incorporate this uh, meta-analysis results into the e-based teaching and learning toolkit, it is important that we understand how relevant this topic or this in the, the outcomes within these studies are to our context, how it, uh, expensive is it to our context, how important it is for the different stakeholders, and what is the effect size. And the graph that we have to the right, we see that this is the pred prediction of this transferability. So in essence, 86% of the outcomes that were in this study were transferable. So it means that they are quite similar to our context, but 13% were not, were not transferable. And it was important that we start reflecting on this 13%. How will it affect if we had to roll out this intervention in our context without any modification? Now, this is the steps that we take in, the, in predicting transferability. First, we have the global evidence, which I've spoke about earlier, the stakeholder engagement, which I also spoke about earlier. Then the discussions around transferability. Then we model the transferability, which is in the big data that we saw, and then using mathematical formula. And then we predict the transferability if we should grow this out or if we should test altogether. And the transferability model is, using within the, is used within the classification and regression tree algor algorithm. And by virtue of interactions between key stakeholders, uh, interventions in different interve interactions with different interventions were determined if they are transferable or not. So this model is in development and it helps us to predict uh, transferability. This is an example of the tree that was pulled out from the mathematical formula by our IT team. Uh, 
and it can tell you it, it, it shows you the tree how we follow from cost complexity relevance and down to decision if we should uh, adopt adapt or we evaluate the intervention now um, to look a little bit about further in, in, in interpretation interpretations and improvement as, as I mentioned earlier it's important to look at this tool at this point as work in progress the model predicts the transferability of meta-analysis of individual interventions and sometimes it could even go into details of outcomes within interventions within studies so predicted interventions will further be grouped into various strands to come to, to to inform uh, teaching practice teaching and learning and generally and these values have not been agreed on as yet generally if we have scores predictability above 60 percent probabilities of interventions in a specific strand these are grouped together and we predict them as being transferable so to an extent we can roll this out in our context without fear that it, there would be much problem then uh, adoption uh, so usually as i mentioned 80 to to, to 100 percent uh, we can we can always roll this out but as I said, but as I'm saying here, uh, there always needs to be some adaptation. For example, if we looked at the, 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 the meta-analysis from, from the Dietrichsen study, we find out that the only difference there may be the grade 7 to 12. So we may need to adapt and understand that grade 7 to 12 is this age group. Then we bring this age group to our context. And that age group may be different, may not be in that class. So these are some of the things, the, the considerations we do, but most of the times 80 to 100% we can adopt. Then 50 to 80%, we need to do some contextualization. We need to modify here and there. For example, parental engagement was one of the topics that we needed to do some bit of from the toolkit from EEF. And then in certain cases, we have to do an impact evaluation from scratch. And it's interesting because with our evidence, gap map that we developed within this program, it's easier for us to identify areas where more studies need to be done and we can take this up to donors. And in one of those settings, it was pay for performance, which was actually funded by the World Bank in Cameroon, which we have now conducted a, a, a pilot project, a pilot study, which has demonstrated uh, acceptability and feasibility and interrelatability with the concept. And we intend, we hope to be able to find funding to do an impact evaluation at scale. The menstrual hygiene management was also a similar one, and we've completed concluded the, the menstrual hygiene uh, pilot project now with very promising results, and we are about to move into an impact evaluation for that. All of this will inform what, how we incorporate this into the toolkit. If we look at the slides, we will see that there are three representations on the slide. The first one for pay for performance has three calories. Calories represents cost because in Africa, calories were the, 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 the mode of trading before the, the, the colonial introduction of legal tender of money, etc. So this tells you that performance uh, pay, performance-based financing is, is moderate cost, but the evidence behind it is limited. But based on global evidence, kids undergoing pay for performance could actually gain one month compared to kids who were not uh, undergoing it. It's the same thing for menstrual hygiene, but interesting for menstrual hygiene, we find out that the evidence behind it is insufficient. So we cannot say how impactful menstrual hygiene management is for improving uh, teaching and learning. And yet menstrual hygiene management is one of the programs that really is widespread. Now here we have the e-based learning and to, uh, uh, te teaching and learning toolkit, which you can find on that website, ebaselearning.org. And I would really like to encourage all our viewers or our audience to visit this site and explore and give us feedback. And please be happy to give us feedback on Twitter or by email uh, using our Twitter handle. Uh, 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 this is really welcome. So here we see an example of how the three different strands are represented. Please remember that within each of these strands, there are different interventions. And within each of these interventions, 
There are different meta analyses of different studies with different outcomes. So there's a lot of work that is packaged in each of these strands. And we are really, really excited to be sharing this with the global evidence community. And here is a school that is one of our evidence schools in, in the far north regions of Cameroon. So this is, for example, to let you understand the challenges that we have uh, in rolling out evidence and the importance of contextualizing. Because if you compare this with the school in the north, in the northern uh, hemisphere, it's very different. Uh, if you look at, for example, built environment within the EEF teaching and learning toolkit, is no longer needed. In essence, because um, they, they, because the, the schools in Europe, in, in the UK, have actually reached a diminishing marginal return for development of a built environment. The more they do, they don't get any impact. But if you look at this school, you will notice that there is just one classroom that's actually really built. Most of the other classrooms are just a roofed portion that kids have to just sit under the roof and it's all open. So you find out that this is a stacking, stacking difference to tell you that even though the EEF toolkit says that there is no added value for improving built environment, the, the e-based teaching and learning toolkit believes that there is huge value for built environment in our context. Um, now, transferring policy to practice, uh, to policy, transferring evidence to policy, practice, and public. Now, we at eBase, we want to look beyond practice. Generally, evidence portals are targeting practitioners and sometimes or beginning to be much more interest for policymakers. But the public is largely ignored. Yet, it's in the public uh, milieu that you would have the action, the real action of the research that we conduct. So the policy events, the audits and feedback that we conduct will target policymakers and practitioners. And these are all innovations that go beyond what is currently done in the global setting. They do give, um, um, they do give policy briefs, uh, evidence summaries, but we have taken this further to policy events, which is something else that we can discuss uh, in a, a whole lot, one hour project or session. And then we also do the audits and feedback, which is becoming quite popular in healthcare, but not in teaching and learning. But in particular, our storytelling, which is our flagship approach, goes beyond plain language summaries and gets research evidence into characters of lives in a story and let the community members understand what will happen if they uptake research evidence by watching uh, uh, characters in a story. And uh, we are really proud that these approaches that we have developed have largely contributed to the award that we have won with the, with the, with, with the Campbell collaboration, the Robert Baruch Award, which I was the proud winner for this year. So thank you very much uh, for your kind attention. And I'm happy to welcome your questions, your comments. And I, I really want to add that in, 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 cons in consonance with the Forbes uh, magazine, we want to say that we want to help Africa develop the curriculum that means business. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful presentation, Patrick. Thanks so much. Um, what we're going to do, because there's loads of questions coming in through the live Q&A, um, we're going to move straight to that. I'm going to introduce Sarah Miller that's going to lead the Q&A. Um, just during that time, Patrick, I might ask you to stop sharing your slides um, and then uh, we can get the next set up. So Sarah Miller is the co-chair and editor of the Campbell Education Coordinating Group. She's also director of Campbell UK and Ireland. She's professor of education at Queen's University in Belfast. And her research focuses on children's social, emotional development and academic attainment. She has considerable methodological and statistical expertise, which includes the conduct and analysis of randomized controlled trials, as well as systematic reviews and meta-analyses. Sarah is co-author of the book, Using Randomized Controlled Trials in Education, which was published by Sage Publications uh, in 2017. So over to you, Sarah, to lead the Q&A um, from the chat directly to our presenters. 
Thank you very much, uh, Roisin, and uh, thank you, Steve and Patrick, as well. That was so interesting and fascinating, and uh, I can tell you that there's been um, uh, lots of questions in the chat as well, some of which have been answered, but I'm going to um, put to you some of the, uh, the remaining questions. I have 150 of my own questions, um, and uh, I am not going to ask those immediately. Um, but one of... Um, Vivian um, uh, asked, uh, and I think um, this is probably relevant to both of you, but I'll put it to Steve first if that's okay. Um, how can evidence synthesis organisations like Campbell um, keep up with living reviews in terms of developing more agile editorial processes uh, to make it easy to continuously update a review? I wonder if you've thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's actually a really interesting question, because at, at what point do you snapshot uh, a living review into some kind of outcomes? To what extent are there, is the whole review and its findings and out outcomes being updated? Or every now and again, you take a kind of a snapshot as a public record um, that gets archived in some way? Um, I, I don't have an answer to that. I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, Epicenter is certainly developing tools to enable a database to be snapshot and frozen so you can take a point in time and then uh, a, a report or findings could be kind of linked to that and then go through the editorial process. Um, it ought to streamline aspects of the editorial process, particularly around methodology, because if you've got a living review that's being updated that's previously been through the review process, it should be a pretty light touch. So I think there are wins, but also some challenges uh, in how this is going to influence the uh, uh, editing and validation process. Yeah, no, I can see that. And one of the things that really struck me um, while you were talking, and you were talking about sort of backfilling um, the, the evidence database that you have been uh, creating. Um, and often as systematic reviewers, we're prospectively sort of planning our searches. Are there any innovations in sort of the search and retrieval uh, methods that you think would be useful for um, sort of systematic reviewers going forward? Things that we can now start to plan into our search strategies that you have sort of um, come across through what you've been doing in a quite a unique, but I think innovative way. Yeah, I mean, search retrieval is still time consuming because you still end up with um, usually a large number of studies that need to be screened on full text. Um, there are some innovations that are useful and certainly kind of web, it depends on um, university libraries that sometimes kind of have single point of access that get you into the journals. Uh, there are also now um, widgets in most of the browsers that will take you to a paper if it's available um, open access. So things like that can speed up that process. Um, but the, the the time consuming part of it, which is reading the paper to find out whether it meets all the inclusion criteria is not going to change. Uh, I think at some point it might be possible to have some semi-automated way of screening full text documents against criteria, but it's going to be a while before I think that process can be um, automated or semi-automated, particularly in education. Uh, Mike issues, um, but uh, thank you. Um, when we were listening, Patrick, to you talking about sort of the amazing work that you have been doing with your team in terms of contextualizing evidence. And I think this is something that is of certainly great interest to all of us when we are trying to apply evidence in situations where perhaps that evidence wasn't originally connected and how do we make the best use of that? Um, Gemma has asked a question um, around uh, the assessment, um, and I had a similar question actually. So Gemma wonders how far the assessment of transferability or adaptation depends on a different evidence base, not in the studies themselves. And does that imply investment in studying context alongside investing in knowledge exchange tools? And I just wonder, is there more you'd like to say about that contextualization of the, the challenges therein? Um, yes, thank you. So uh, um, there is there is need for investment um, uh, within the context because you need the context 
the, the, the engagement with the different stakeholders to understand the relevance or the complexity or the cost of the of the evidence that you are importing sort of uh, however that cost is way lower than the cost of conducting new research and then uh, synthesizing that evidence and then transferring it so that's our experience don't know if that covers the question thank you and i wonder then as well in terms of the um adaptability or the transferability model that you referred to um, and you talked about some of the accuracies um, of your predictions. Have you evaluated or do you know in practice whether those predictions have been accurate and whether, you know, how, how are you kind of adapting that as you move on? Yes, so I think that's a very interesting question and thank you for that. We've been having discussions around uh, evaluating this process uh, we do need large uh, quantity of data and it's also ex an expensive process uh, we are going to probably need a lot of machine developing a lot of machine learning tools or process or getting people who can manage machine learning and uh, this is an opportunity for investment for for people to, for for donors to take a look uh, a lead on this or for grants now our main challenge is uh, competing at global level for this kind of grants uh, if we are going for these grants, sometimes there are bigger uh, universities that are going for grants for other things. So they tend to see these people more than us, or they tend to not understand at all the importance of what we are doing, or they may not even relate to it at all. So uh, it, it's a huge opportunity for investments, and we are still looking at, we are, we are preparing a paper to publish, hoping that with this publication, it will increase our chances of communicating the necessity, the importance better to donors. So this is where we are, for example. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I you is, I'm sure this has been an enormous learning process as all innovations in these kind of areas are. And what would your main advice be then for um, other um, the people or organizations who might want to take up the baton and replicate what you have done in their context? Do you have any kind of key learning points that you can perhaps distill into uh, one or two uh, that you could share? Yeah, so I think a learning point I would like to give is that uh, at the outset, it looks like a very exciting uh, process. And yes, it's, it's quite exciting. But the challenges are quite daunting and the challenges include um, uh, you, you are not doing this alone you are doing this with the hope that uh, you can be able to stimulate uh, uh, the, the, the policy makers the practitioners the public to take this up because it's something that we understand that's important for them and uh, but to, to 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 overcome that preliminary barrier is extremely difficult because you are talking about something which is what they want, but which they do not still understand that that's what they want. So the they, 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 they advice that I will give in this uh, here is that they shouldn't have one strategy and they should be ready to change tactics at every time and to be innovative, to be curious, to be creative if they want to actually move forward. They may start off in the morning with just developing evidence summaries and handing out to policymakers. But by the time you get to the policymakers, you realize that handing them evidence summaries will actually mean nothing to them. They will tell you that, okay, I want evidence summaries on competency-based learning, for example. And you bring evidence on competency-based learning and they say, what is this? So that is what you have to understand that you need to always change your tactics. And that is what led us to come up with all these innovative approaches like the policy events, like the audits and feedback, like the storytelling to move forward. So my advice would be in a new setting, always be curious, always be creative, and then this will lead to innovation and you'll be able to break through. Thank you. That's brilliant, Patrick. I actually think that um, for life in general, um, so I'm actually going to uh, go back to you, uh, Steve, if that's okay. And I want to know, well, it applies to both of you, but um, I want to know as a community of education researchers um, in systematic reviews and collecting primary uh, data as well, 
how can we contribute um, to the, the work that you're doing? And I suppose I'm thinking you maybe alluded to some of this, uh, Steve, in your talk, but is it through the addition of, or the proposal of additional strands in the toolkit, additional outcomes or studies um, while we sort of plug in and perhaps use the existing framework that you have? Have you any advice for us in terms of how we can kind of work together? And this is, I was going to say it's not me inveigling my way into working with you, but it kind of is. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, what we're trying to do will only work uh, if we can get kind of more people on board. My, my vision for the database in the long run would that it would become kind of more open and shareable, so you'd be able to import and export studies. That means we need some work on kind of agreeing definitions and classifications within the, the data structure. But so much of the um, time taken in a systematic review is uh, identifying the studies and then doing what I think of as the fairly boring data extraction of the descriptive, some nuts and bolts information in the study. Now, if, if that was um, kind of shared or, or and more available, then we could do uh, try and address more interesting questions. So, so it'd be easier to do mixed methods reviews, for example, if we've got that kind of bulk of that information already um, uh, prepared, or at least for say, you know, 60, 70% of the studies, then we can start to look at more complex classification, uh, uh, think of other ways of um, uh, undertaking data extraction. So I, I think kind of come and play would be my, my plea can we start to think about um, how, what are the what are the common categories that everyone's gonna want and can we agree some definitions? Can we work with Epi to build some basic import and export functions? So when you do a, a search in OpenAlex, if that study's already been coded, uh, that's flagged up and you not, not only can identify the study, but you can download the coding for that study. I mean, that would be, if, if, if that, if that's possible, it would be amazing to achieve because it, it would make the process of undertaking systematic review uh, much quicker, but I think also more interesting because it would start to become more innovative. You're so exhausted by the time you've done a systematic review, it's really hard to be creative in the sort of data analysis and presentation process. Whereas if we could share some of that, um, it might make it easier to be more creative and developmental in the way systematic review and meta-analysis develops. Brilliant. Yes. Well, I realized because um, I hope everybody listening does. I'm sure they do because it feels like a family and um, who doesn't want to be part of a family and part of innovation and doing exciting things. Thank you so much, both of you. Can I just say one, one, one final thing? Because the, the collaboration with eBase was um, so important in helping me understand uh, some aspects of systematic review and thinking about evidence and transferability. I was really, really, really nervous when uh, Patrick and eBase approached us to want to use and share the, the global database that we've got because I, I was really anxious about how applicable or transferable it would, would be. But you can see how exciting it's been to work with Patrick and his team because they've thought about that really, really carefully. So my, my anxiety be like diminished because they kind of took away that concern I had about I've got this largely developed country database. Um, is it going to be any use? Um, and his team have, have really been inspiring in the way that they've developed some of their ideas um, through working with that data. Sorry, I'm, I'm interrupted. <laughs> Until uh, sort of listening to Patrick, and one of the things that we are really kind of thinking about a lot now in uh, the education coordinating group, but also in Campbell as a whole, is how do we make the evidence that we have relevant in contexts that are different, um, and and how do we best do that? And Patrick, it sounds like your model is probably what we're all going to be be following. So expect some uh, follow up emails. I should think I'm going to stop talking and um, and hand back over to Roisin. <laughs> Thanks both. I want to again just thank our speakers so much, Patrick and Steve. Wonderful presentations. Thanks again for thought provoking um, talks. I think the conversation will continue after this. We've loads of other questions. And again, to those of you in the audience, 
really reach out to the presenters directly. Um, we apologize if we didn't get to all of your questions. Um, I also want to encourage anyone who's listening to join the informal chat rooms after this, the post sessions, and of course, to visit the poster gallery. And I do just want to mention another session. If you want to really hear from Sarah and I again and learn a little bit more about Campbell Collaboration's Education Coordinating Group, we will be holding a session this afternoon. It's session 6.2. It's titled Disability and Education Coordinating Groups, Maximizing Impact Through Evidence Synthesis. And that is a joint session between the Campbell Collaboration's Education Coordinating Group and the disability coordinating group. So if you want to learn about how you can get involved and all of the wonderful work that we're doing, please do consider attending that session.